but due to COVID-19, our conference was postponed from last August to the February. Uh, we were thinking like the situation will get better, but unfortunately, again, the situation is same. So due to that is uh, our international speakers, plenary speakers, but unfortunately this year, almost all of our international speakers, plenary keynote and invited speakers, they are not able. Uh, I wish you all a productive uh, three days of the conference. Many interested, interesting uh, talks, uh, uh, online discussions, and of course, uh, we all can be connected uh, via email. But let me switch to the topic of my presentation. I am going to spend the uh, next uh, 40 minutes or so speaking about two-dimensional materials. A very large family of 2D materials, which we call maxines. But before, before maxines, Definitely, there have been other materials. Graphene is certainly the first one. You don't need to be expert in carbon materials, 2D nanomaterials to know at least something about graphene. Discovery of exciting physics in graphene by Andrew Gaim Kostin Vasolov in 2004 led to increasing interest to many other two dimensional materials which are available. Some of them have been known for a very long time, hexagonal boron nitride, clay, 2D oxides, 2D chalcogenides, which were actually separated into single layers even before graphene. But a number of them were discovered later, produced from materials often, which don't have two-dimensional, uh, not two-dimensional, layered Van der Waals bonded or weakly bonded precursors like silicine, germanine, borophene, phosphorine. So people really got excited about opportunities in the two-dimensional world. And the reason for this is because 2D materials show a very wide variety of electronic properties. And they range from semiconductors to insulators to semi-metals, graphene, for example, a zero band gap semiconductor. Maxines, you will hear about today, actually add a large family of 2D metals to this family. The atomically thin, any thin material is flexible. And if it's additional strong mechanically, it can truly be made for into flexible and also transparent structures. You can see through several atoms, even if this is a heavy metal, a gold. And also, of course, uh, high surface area of 2D materials, open opportunities for application, gas separation to catalysis, to adsorption, to surface redox processes. And in 2011, working with my colleague, Professor Michelle Barzum, and our PhD students, Michelle Nagib, and several other students, postdocs, uh, in my group, we found that transition metal carbides and nitrides, in particular titanium, uh, titanium 3C2 was the first one discovered, can also form two-dimensional structures. The ones which have not been known to exist, not predicted to exist before. And these materials are already shaping into a very, very large family. So, what are maxines? M stands for a transition metal, one of these elements in blue. X stands for carbon or nitrogen. And TX at the end stands for surface termination. It can be oxygen, fluorine, chlorine, actually chalcogens, other halogens, it can be OH which actually increases by an order of magnitude of num the number of distinct possible maxine structures. So what basically these materials are? Those are layers of transition metals bonded by carbons, nitrogen, or their mix. And there can be, of course, at least one carbon nitrogen, two layers of transition metal, but can be three, four layers of transition metals. 
and initially we made them from materials which is known max phases. Michel Barzum is really the father of that field, developing them into materials. They were discovered by Novotny and others before uh, that here, but he really studied them to make ceramics, making high temperature materials. If you look at the max phases, they are basically layers of carbides or nitrides connected by monatomic layers of one of these blue elements, in particular aluminum, silicon, gallium, other ones that have been etched away. We use the same method as we have been using for many years to make, for example, uh, carbide derived carbons, removing monatomic layers of this element over microns distances to release two-dimensional sheets of carbides or nitrides here. And as a result, we get materials with this variety of structures like M2C, M3C2, M4C3. Moreover, we also can have mix of carbon and nitrogen or potentially different transition metals here. What is important in synthesis of these materials? Unlike say graphene or boronitride, they cannot be easily produced by mechanical exfoliation or shearing because there are strong metallic covalent or ionic bonds between this A element, for example, aluminum, silicon, sulfur, and the transition metal. So you have to etch it here. But when you etch it and remove the connecting layers, we replace strong bonds with weak van der Waals or hydrogen bonds between the terminated layers. Naturally, during the chemical reaction, transition metal don't stay unaffected. So they will grab, for example, if etching is done in aqueous environments, oxygen, OH, or fluorine, chlorine, whatever is the etchant. We use initially HF solution. There are many different recipes now, including electrochemical, hydrothermal etching. Also, emulsion salts can be used. In this case, you usually end up with halogen on the surface, like for example, chlorine here. But the result is the same. The bonding, strong chemical bonding is replaced by weak bonding. When you intercalate organic molecules or ions, it's possible just exactly like in many other 2D materials, weakly bonded 2D materials, delaminate them into single layers. What is wonderful about maxims? This is a very, very large family of materials. You may remember how many M elements I showed you. There is a dozen of elements there. And also carbon and nitrogen. And you can form simple structures with two, three, four layers of car uh, metal and one, two or three layers of carbon and nitrogen. But you can make solid solution and actually infinite number. You can mix carbon and nitrogen in the um, carbide uh, nitride sublattice, but you can also mix transition metals and many of them form a solid solution with infinite solubility. But moreover, it's possible to make with some elements atomic sandwiches when one element is on the surface, for example, moly, another is in the middle, for example, titanium. And it's possible to go even further, pushing atomistic design to the level where it's possible to make alternating metal atomic columns. And even further, you can etch one of them, making materials which have like a missing uh, rows of atoms, ordered divacancy maxine. So those are in plane ordered, those are out of plane ordered. So we end up with more than a hundred of stoichiometric structures. If you consider surface termination, this will be more than uh, a thousand of stoichiometric distinct structures. But with solid solution, the number is really infinite. Moreover, discoveries continue. Just like a year ago, it was published in January issue of ACS Nano, we showed that it's possible to make materials with five layers of transition metal, four layers of carbon, moly 4 vc 4 And actually, 
there are quite a few material called dutchel cardinite with three layers of transition of elements oxides others they usually thin going to distinct structures with 10 or more layers of atoms and all sheets are exactly the same is also truly unique for maxims so these materials have many interesting features, but what is also very important, the family keeps growing. Just in 2020, this new structure or basically entire subfamily of materials was added to Maxine's. Michel Barzum's group showed the possibility of etching of Maxine using uh, HF in organic solutions. General Louis acidic etching from molten salt has been demonstrated by Chin Huang from uh, Nimte from Ninbo. And this material showed very interesting electrochemical properties. And Dmitry Talapin from University of Chicago explored similar synthesis to show a very large variety of surface termination, unique, clean, pure surface terminations, and produce the first superconducting maxim. And the growth goes on and on. So basically, we have very large already, more than 30 stoichiometric compositions have been demonstrated. Couple of dozens of solid solutions have been published. And potentially, there is no limit to how many structures and composition you can create in this system. However, are they good for anything? Why would anyone bother to add more two-dimensional materials to the ones we have. There is a good reason for this. As I already mentioned, majority of 2D materials are poor conductors. Even graphene, which is uh, praised, we know it's strongly dependent on stoichiometry. Eutectics uh, with tin that uh, have their melting point below room temperature. Now in our work, we uh, discuss it, discovered uh, somewhat uh, serendipitously, or one might say by accident, because we were using gallium for some other research, uh, that we could mix, uh, for example, graphene oxide into liquid gallium and make these putty-like composites. We refer to this as gallium putty or use this acronym here. So as I mentioned, our, our initial uh, experiments were with graphene oxide. And we, we found by mixing by hand and then using various mechanical stirring devices that we could load up to about 1.8%. Uh, and above that loading level, uh, the composite material would become too viscous to mix further in, uh, further amounts of graphene oxide in. Now, if we used a ball mill, we could actually get up to about 8.0 weight percent. So I'll show this. Uh, oh, I hope to show a video here, but it's not showing. In any case, what the video would have shown is that we could roll this around in our hand, something like putty. Ah, here it is. We could uh, cast this into any shape. So Chun Hui Wang uh, worked uh, on making these putty-like materials and showing that they could be formed into various sorts of figures and into thin films and rods and so on. A very interesting thing is that when the material would solidify, it uh, didn't really show the standard volume expansion that uh, gallium has. Gallium is like water in that it has that unusual phase diagram in which the solid is actually less dense than the liquid, but uh, the change in density of gallium when it solidifies can be problematic for certain applications. Uh, and it's also, of course, scientifically interesting that we see this difference. Another thing is that uh, gallium, as many of you are aware, uh, like mercury and indium, amalgamates with almost all the metals, including at room temperature. Tungsten typically has to be heated a bit. But 
in our putty-like form, we can contact uh, these metals and also many other surfaces and not have the gallium actually mixing with the substrate. And this is valuable for certain applications. So in the cross-section images that you're looking at here, where we created a cross-section and looked with scanning electron microscopy, we could actually uh, find evidence of the dispersed graphene oxide platelets. Uh, some are multi-layer uh, dispersed throughout the gallium. If we heat treated our putty-like mixture, we could end up with a gallium with reduced graphene oxide because of driving off the oxygen from the graphene oxide sheets. And we'd end up with that material uh, allowing us to reform the putty. And then that putty would have a conductive uh, platelet inside it. We could not, however, uh, at least in this work, directly take reduced graphene oxide and mix it into gallium. So we took this somewhat circuitous route to first uh, make this foam-like material, which involved evolution of carbon monoxide and carbon dioxide. And then we could reform the putty-like material and eliminate these voids. I wanted to mention a couple of uh, applications that do look promising. We studied the electromagnetic interference shielding. We found that the shielding efficiency is very, very high for the RGO film. Uh, that is to say the gallium putty with RGO filler, it's just designated in this way here. And we could put that onto paper, we could put it onto RGO film. Uh, the coating itself could be studied if on a paper that has no EMI performance itself. And basic story is that for relatively thin films, we could get a very strong shielding effectiveness. It then occurred to us to try mixing in some other types of particles after our success with graphene oxide. And I had thought that mixing in diamond might be promising for making thermal interface materials. Uh, often I'm wrong in this case, it happened to work rather well. We could also mix in graphite particles and silicon carbide particles. And during the course of our studies, I won't have time to go into great detail. We learned that particle size and roughness influenced whether we could make the putty-like material or not. Now, there's a, a fairly extensive set of literature uh, by, for example, these workers here, but others as well, showing that a thin skin of Ga2O3, gallium oxide, will form on uh, gallium when contacting air. And so we did uh, control experiments where we attempted to make our putty-like material in a glove box, and we were not successful. So uh, that was one of the uh, indications that oxygen, which we had suspected was very important and that it is this gallium oxide skin through constantly mixing air during the mixing of the particles that is playing perhaps a critical role in allowing the particle, particles to be mixed into the gallium. So uh, the sort of cartoon picture is that if this gallium oxide skin can coat the particles either entirely or to some degree, uh, we might be able to mix in to not only two D. For layered structure, the interaction between different layers uh, were very weak. The one was false. At that time. We didn't study any properties and applications of the 2H gold because the yield of the 2H gold is quite low. So fortunately, in 2015, we got the 4H gold. This gold is very, very unique. The very, very long and also the thickness is several nanometer and the cross phase is different from the 2H, different from thermodynamic stable FCC phase. Based on high resolution TM imaging and other technique measurements, we use this model 
to demonstrate the price structure, it is a ABCB, ABCB stacking. We call this a four edge structure. This is also one kind of hexagon structure, but different from the two edge and FCC. The important thing is here we can decide the four edge gold line ribbon very, very pure. So we can use it for various application and property study. So normally, as a chemistry material scientist, if you can directly synthesize nanostructures with unconventional phase, that's great. Right? You can scale up, but sometimes because unconventional phase has high energy compared to thermodynamic stable phase, it's not quite stable. So in that case, it's quite difficult to synthesize directly. However, we already have the two edge gold, four edge gold based on epitaxial growth of the nanostructure, you can synthesize other 2H or 4H metals by using the 2H and the 4H gold as a template. So I'll give you some example. So here, by using the 4H gold nano ribbon as a template, you can epitaxial growth the silver on the surface. However, it's very difficult to distinguish the silver and the gold because they, they uh, they are uh, just like twins, right? Okay, so it's very difficult to distinguish them. But however, by using element mapping, it's easy to see the gold there and also whatever thin layer of the silver coated on the gold. So in this part, we already have the four edge gold. So in, at the end, uh, in the edge, okay, then of this uh, nano ribbon, of course, the silver is a four edge. Because gold and silver, just like twins, and the lattice structures are similar, lattice mismatch is very, very small. It's easy for silver to attack the growth on the gold. So if you change it to other element, for example, the PD, one kind of of our metals, so you can see you can grow, of course, you can grow for HPD, but structure is quite different. It's just like the, the island structure. We can also grow PT to get the unconventional phase. 4H phase, or even iridium and others, for example, rhodium, osmium, and uh, rucinium. So we can get the 4H phase of you know, by all Nobel metal nanostructures. But how about the other transition metal with 4H phase? Can we get it? Fortunately, we also got this kind of the, uh, 4H phase for copper, because copper is quite common. Or uh, a catalyst for CO2 reduction. But until now, people you know, studied the copper-based CO2 reduction, only focus on the morphology control, architecture control, and others. Nobody studied the price phase dependent CO2 reduction on copper catalyst. This is our goal. And later, I will show some example for you. Not only single element can be epitaxial growth on the surface, of the 4H gold to form the 4H unconventional phase. How about alloy? So ba uh, based on our previous result, we can coat the silver on the surface to get 4H silver. After that, if you use a galvanic reaction, you can get the PT silver, PT silver, PD, PT silver, the alloy with the 4H gold. So for example, here, the PD silver, PT silver, 4H part is here. Uh, and also this PT, uh, this PT silver, 4H FCC structure shows better catalytic compared to the PT black. PT black is FCC structure, right? So it means 4H structure might have applications for the HER compared to normal PT black. It shows better performance, right? This is a three element with a forge structure, okay? So how about the other materials? For example, magnetic materials, cobalt or nickel. Can we get the unconventional phase? So recently, we published a paper and demonstrate the growth of the cobalt on the surface of a forge gold. So here we call this a quasi epitaxial growth. I will show it later. So here shows you some high, uh, High uniform, the nanobranched structure of the 
cobalt grows on this uh, forge, the gold. They form the kosher structure, right? So based on high resolution TEM image, we can see they follow this kind of the uh, epitaxial growth, but not completely. So we call this quasi epitaxial growth because based on the structure, okay, we can see the six lengths of the gold is similar to the eight lengths of the cobalt atoms. So in that case, if you want to epitaxial growth, you have the inset part here, okay? So we can use this model to see it more clearly. So here, the six gold will be linked to the six cobalt. But after that, one cobalt will be, cobalt layer will be inset here to match the length equal. Based on high resolution TME media and also model, we found the repeated unit of the cobalt is not seven cobalt, actually it's a 14 cobalt. So this highest, uh, the largest the cobalt unit, we call the 4H, uh, 14H. Yeah. On silicon carbide. So that was the graphene. But we were not so fully aware what this was uh, good for and so on. But as a grower, we were very interested in that. And then we continued the studies and had the diploma thesis uh, in 2008 and so on. And then 2010, it was demonstrated a very nice uh, result of using this material. So together with other researchers, they presented a quantum resistance standard or toward result towards a quantum resistance standard using epitaxial graphene. Uh, and some important things which are in the in this context because it's very tricky to intentionally produce one layer of carbon on the surface so here you have the vapor pressures they depend on the temperature what are the vapor pressures so that has an influence on the silicon to carbon ratio how much to have this shift and so on with temperature and in many materials you have the steps which are formed uh, and they can form step bunching, which is not good for the growth. But this is also a way actually to make the graphene on silicon carbide because you have the bilayers and then the graphene start from the, from the edge and so on. So then the steps are very important. And in, in the case of silicon carbide, depending on the polytype, you have various bilayers and then there are several small steps which are, are, are merging on that. And the surfaces can look like uh, very different depending on how we have pre-treated the substrate before. So either there are intentionally made steps or there will be some domains and so on and different features. In some cases, these are not good for some, some, uh, uh, some applications, but sometimes actually these features are useful. For example, on the left side, you have straight steps. And when we have such surface from the beginning, then we can create uh, ribbons of, of graphene along the steps. So they don't form two dimensional layers over the whole surface, they are ribbons and so on. But from a research point of view, this is very exciting. And in silicon carbide, when you do silicon and carbon at them, you can stack them in different ways. You have the hexagonal ones, the 6H silicon carbide, the 4H silicon carbide, but also the cubic silicon carbide, which is very difficult, difficult to grow because it's uh, metastable. Uh, but they have some different uh, stacking sequences and uh, some difference in properties. So when actually doing graphene on these surfaces, the behavior are different. If we use similar conditions, there will be different behaviors. And sometimes we, we need to uh, modify the process for a certain polytype and so on. But there are some very interesting features happening uh, just due to the nature of the different polytypes. And uh, this we did in the research. So, so the, the leading professor in the graphene in our group, Professor Rutsitsa Yakimova, uh, and we had many collaborations and more and more collaborations. And then actually, uh, when we made samples for free for the research, then it became so much interest that we did not know what to do with this. So then we actually uh, started the company. 
So this became the second inspiration for creating utilization from the research findings. So we were able to sell material, but there is, is no application. We chose that because they're so thin, the short channel effects are reduced in, this, in these devices. So they're suitable for scaling down devices and realizing nanoscale devices. Also, um, photo detectors made of these 2D TMDCs show extremely high uh, photoresponsivity and quantum efficiencies. This is because of the photo gating effects um, um, from defect, ambient defect, which are quite dominant for, for the 2D materials. Besides electronics and optoelectronic devices, 2D TMDCs are also widely studied as an electrode materials in batteries and catalysts. One unique about one unique thing about 2D materials is that they're ideally dangling bone free, meaning that they can be easily attached by uh, weak bend of both forces and create clean and atomically sharp interface in 2D heterostructures. As you can see in the Lego image, van der Waals materials can be easily attached or detached using transfer and alignment processes. So using various van der Waals materials and using their um, fundamental band gaps and transport properties, one can design various heterojunctions and devices with varying device performances. Also, recently, as you can see in the bottom image, um, right image here, um, 2D motors can stack with different stacking angles to show that at a certain stacking angle, interesting properties such as superconductivity or um, unique interlayer or um, hybridized excitons can be found. These 2D materials are highly suitable for future flexible devices because Firstly, they have good um, field effect mobilities, um, and as the channel thickness is reduced, they have greater flexibility, transparency, and a gate control. And as you can see in the right image here, um, the strain limit of 2D materials are far greater than the strain limit of conventional bulk semiconductors such as 3.5 semiconductors or silicon. Two D materials based devices can be fabricated using different um, two D materials such as uh, metallic graphene, insulating HBN, and semiconducting MOS2 or using fabrication methods such as um, inkjet printing. 2D modules can be integrated onto various flexible devices. Um, these days, electronic devices need to be bendable, foldable, or even rollable. And such properties are also required for various wearable devices. Using 2D materials and their ability to be flexible and transparent, they're highly suitable for various future flexible and wearable devices. From here, I'll discuss our CVD method for realizing large size TMDC monolayers and their heterostructures. percent to 100 percent but as you can see the uh, low limit is quite high so it is quite difficult to uh, to detect uh, the low concentration hydrogen as i mentioned before the electrochemical sensor and metal oxide sensor uh, also uh, restrict uh, lifetime and higher portion te temperature uh, respectively uh, these days, the semiconductor-based uh, hydrogen sensor are uh, used. Uh, in the case, uh, this semiconductor device-based sensor uh, has advantage of uh, low cost, small size, uh, mass production uh, 
mass production. Yeah, this slide shows the future trend of gas sensor technology. Uh, I believe the future gas sensor have to have a uh, small size and low power consumption and uh, high sensitivity and it can detect uh, several gases simultaneously. It means the combo type uh, semiconductor. Uh, the semicon so semiconductor device based sensor are well fit with the future trend of gas sensors. That's why I choose the compound semiconductor as, uh, as uh, the hydrogen sensor starting materials. Okay, I briefly introduced the uh, gallium nitrate based uh, compound semiconductor. Compound, compound semiconductor is a semiconductor composed of two or more elements, uh, like uh, gallium nitride, gallium acinide, and silicon carbide, etc. The, the, the table shows the uh, physical property, uh, comparison result of uh, physical property of gallium semi compound semiconductor and silicon. Uh, as you can see, the gallium nitrate has wide band gap and high electron mobility compared uh, to silicon. The typical example of uh, gallium nitride material, gallium nitride based uh, device is white, white emitting diode, the blue, green, and UV LED. I think that uh, these days everyone uses uh, LED and uh, LED, and uh, this LED is uh, made of gallium nitride materials. Another example, gallium nitride is optical device. And uh, another example of gallium nitride electronic device is power amplifier, uh, like 5G base station power amplifier and radar of a military application. Uh, this slide uh, uh, explained uh, uh, why aluminum gallium nitride and, and gallium nitride heterostructure is important. Hemp is tempo high electromobility transistor. If we grow the, uh, the aluminum gallium nitride and gallium nitride heterostructure, uh, due to the spontaneous and piezoelectric polarization effect, uh, there are two dimensional electron gas are formed between aluminum gallium nitride and gallium nitride. So uh, these two dimensional el electron gas, gas mobility is quite high. So we can handle the uh, nanoparticles forming the aggregate nanocrystallines. We measured the spectrum of these hybrid complexes and found that the resulting spectra had the features both of the induced transparency and Rabbit splitting phenomenon. Moreover, with increasing the JC1 concentration, the energy of the splitting between two polariton peaks was increased. However, the dependence was saturated. One can see the presence of the J band in the resulting spectrum or at higher concentrations than concentration of the saturation. This means that at the, these concentrations, some J aggregates are, are uncoupled and cannot negatively interfere with a plasma mode, which leads to the simple superposition of the J band spectrum with the spectrum of plasma exciting complexes. Thus, we reached the concentrations of the maximum covering of the nanoplates with J aggregates with maximum rabbit splitting energy of 450 milli electron volts. This also corresponds to the 50 excitons involved in the plasma exciton coupling. We need to note that the observed mode is not truly strongly coupled because the splitting energy was lower than the width of the initial plasma spectrum. We can formally attribute this regime to the intermediate coupling, which have features of both induced transparency and Rabbi splitting phenomena. However, this is only formally because the plasmon spectral width 
was a result not the homogeneous broadening but the result of the wide size distribution. If we calculate the spectrum of the system of individual silver nanoplate coupled with J aggregates shell, we will see how the coupling was realized for nanoparticles of different size. The lower spectrum corresponds to the smaller nanoplates and upper spectrum corresponds to the bigger nanoplate in the distribution. One can see the pure anti-crossing behavior with, which corresponds to the strong coupling regime. Then we performed experiment where we reduced the pH of the water solution of the plasmon exciting complexes and measured the corresponding spectra. One can see that the reducing of the pH strongly affected the plasmon exciting spectrum. As formally, the coupling mode is intermediate, so we measured both induced transparency deep and the splitting energy. Top right graph shows that the reduction of pH led to a decrease of the rubber splitting energy from approximately 450 milli electron volts at the pH range from 8 to 11 to about 200 milli electron volts uh, at pH of 2. It can be seen that the change in the splitting with a decrease in the pH value from 11 to 8 was very weak but the change from 7 to 2 was very strong. Another possible modality of monitoring pH is the use of the induced transparency phenomenon. Lower light graph shows the dependence of the transparency deep on the pH of the solution. It is almost linear in the range from pH 11 to pH 2 with a two-fold total change. Thus, Two different parameters can be used for remote sensing of pH with the use of the designed plasmon exciting complexes, the rubber splitting energy and the relative depth of the induced transparency deep. Moreover, the rubber splitting in tissue invasion and metastasis, the um, replicative potential has been increased and uh, Angiogenesis, where the blood vessel uh, being, uh, is growing to promote cancer cell growth, and also uh, they are avoiding apoptosis, the cells, cancer cells. Um, when it comes to chemotherapeutics, there is a new development in terms of nano-targeted drug delivery system uh, for control release and with a more tunable release mechanism and uh, the need for to um, characterize the cells and also uh, the biomarkers and the uh, transduction pathways. The problem with uh, chemotherapeutic therapeutic drugs, some of them are that they damage both normal and cancerous cells leading to various side effects. Uh, it's also, the drug is also easily broken down by physiological immune re reactions in the body. And the, the drugs normally have low solubility, uh, limited bioaccessibility, uh, less ability to spread to other to the outer membrane, requires high quantity for intravenous intake and some undesirable effects. So drug delivery system has been developed to control the delivery of pharmaceutical compounds. Um, different types of DDS has been developed so far, including liposomes, proliposomes, pro-drugs, cyclodextrins, microspheres, gels, and dendrimas. And nanotechnologies uh, in the last 20 or 30 years have developed nanovectors with drug loading using uh, chemical synthesis and bonding, different chemical bonding, uh, where you can have multi, multiple nano components uh, where each can be designed to accomplish a specific task, for example, to overcome multi-drug resistance or for direct delivery of therapeutics. Uh, the combinatorial therapy with nano medicines could eliminate metastasis and also to eliminate uh, recurrence of tumor uh, after the first treatment. And these are some examples, uh, nanosphere, you have micelle, a liposome, and also dendrima. And uh, the different types of uh, mechanisms 
these different types of uh, drug drug carriers can can be affected by temperature, pH, osmotic control delivery, and, and uh, enzymes. In terms of silver nanoparticles, the nanostructures uh, could control the stability and solubility of the cancer drugs. It, pro it prevent uh, drug degradation, enhance half-life uh, for uh, blood circulation and targeting and distribution. Um, drug release can be uh, targeted at the cancer sites and also reduce the drug resistance. Silver nanoparticles in cancer treatment may be in the form of passive or active targeting. Uh, but the aggregation of the drugs at the target site could increase the activity of anti-cancer therapy. These are some of the advantages of uh, silver nanoparticles, biocompatibility uh, and selectively towards uh, malignant cells, uh, phototermal and chemotherapy, control drug delivery, uh, the synthesis, facile synthesis for functionalization and tunability, and also high drug loading capacity. Uh, this is the example of a mechanism involving uh, al alendronate, uh, which is the, actually uh, a different drug uh, for osteoporosis. But when you combine this with um, RHB and doxorubicin, you... Uh, that is 1 to uh, 1, 1 to 10, and uh, 10 to 1 between quantum dots and polymer matrix along, the, along uh, with variation of the polymer matrix. And uh, after the filling deposition, uh, we measured the luminescence spectra uh, <clears throat> to study the dynamics of changes uh, in the luminescence of these composites. Uh, the, the photoluminescence spectra of the samples were measured immediately after preparation and uh, after uh, seven days of the storage in the dark. Um, and uh, on the slide, I showed the limits and spectra of the film composites made from different polymers, uh, P79, P99, and uh, P133. Uh, uh, containing um, quantum dots with original HDAP ligands, uh, which are lymphatic uh, ligands. Uh, the quantum dot to polymer ratio here is uh, 1 to 10, and uh, as can be seen, the minor changes, uh, changes were observed. In this case, uh, when the amount of polymer considerably exceeded the mass content of uh, quantum dots, uh, it uh, can be assumed that uh, in the case of relatively low quantum dot content in the composite, the probability of uh, quantum dot aggregation was low, which led to a more uniform distribution uh, uh, and uh, better separation of nanoparticles over the volume of the sample. Uh, however, the photoluminescent spectrum of the obtained composites was strongly shifted towards the blue region. Uh, when the amount of polymers uh, was approximately equal to quantum dots, uh, slight changes in the line shapes begin to appear after a week of storage in the dark. And uh, uh, the increase of quantum dot to polymer ratio tenfold led uh, to almost complete disappearance of the polymer luminescence relatively uh, to quantum dot due to the large quanti uh, quantitative uh, advantage of nanoparticles. Uh, which leads uh, to an increase in the luminescence signal as well as to a high probability of non radiative transfer of excitation from the polymer to quantum dots. Uh, the increase, uh, oh, I'm sorry, analysis of the uh, emission color coordinates uh, of the composite films showed that the uh, quantum dot P99 composite film with quantum dot to polymer mass ratio of 1 to 10. Uh, was the closest to the absolutely white point, which is uh, D65 uh, on the slide, uh, which corresponds to the emission of a standard daylight source established by the International Commission of Illumination. Uh, we suppose that uh, the uh, effect of time-dependent deterioration of quantum dot to polymer uh, composites was caused uh, by bad compatibility of the original aliphatic ligands of the quantum dots with the polymer matrix. Indeed, uh, this incompatibility could lead to severe aggregation of quantum dots in the composite, leading to photoluminescence quenching and uh, non uniform energy to charge transfer at uh, the polymer quantum dot interface. 
Uh, moreover, there are large uh, differences in the chemical structure of the polymer matrix and quantum dot organic ligands uh, could lead to time dependent reorganization of the component in the bulk composite, leading to phase segregation, which would further alter the composite luminescence spec properties. And therefore, the next step was uh, the quantum dot surface ligand variation. Uh, in order to study the effect of quantum dot ligands on the luminescent properties of the composites, the initial uh, ligands HDAPA uh, were replaced with ligand structure resembling the used polyfluorines, uh, uh, such uh, called uh, as nihexacide. Alpha phase. So to convert its alpha phase to beta phase, we normally need uh, some amount of energy to uh, overcome the steric effect of fluoride groups. Uh, on the uh, one side of the carbon chain. So there are many strategies has been applied to achieve the beta phase like electrospinning in which we need high voltage and the mechanical mixing of fillers with the PVDF. But these techniques have some limitation like we need a, a mat transfer for case of electrospinning and we need high voltage which is no uh, which is which kind of, uh, some kind of energy wastage at the industrial scale. And the second thing, in case of the mechanical mixing, the fillers cannot be easily dispersed in the polymeric solution because of its high viscosity. And also the reaction time is very, it, uh, very long. So it is time consuming technique. So considering this limitation, I am going to here introduce uh, 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 a strategy to improve uh, the, uh, to prove, to remove the limitations of the previous strategies. And also, I am going to get the good dispersion in the in the one step reaction um, by adding the RGO fill as filler in PVDF. So, what are the benefits of my uh, strategy here? I will uh, in which I will add uh, filler in, uh, by in situ addition is a no mat transfer needed for this one, and also uh, it enhance the interfacial interaction and also homogeneous filler dispersion can be uh, achieved by this method. So this is the main mechanism how it will work. Uh, this is the structure of uh, RGO, chemical structure of RGO and it has OH group on its uh, on its surface. And this OH group first uh, interact with the ionic liquid and make a network like uh, electric field network and which will interact with PVDF uh, fluoride group and it will repel the PVDF group towards the one, only one side and it will overcome the static hindrance of fluoride, fluoride group. In this way, we can get easily the beta phase. The problem was the poor, uh, poor dispersion of the fillers, but in, in, uh, in this case, we are uh, achieving this uh, dispersion by adding both the fillers and uh, during the synthesis of RGU. So this is the experimental strategy, how we are getting this uh, uh, by in situ addition. First of all, we prepare the geo uh, by oxidation of graphite and then after uh, uh, preparation of uh, graphite oxide, we reduce it and during its reduction, we added ionic liquid and the uh, PVDF inside this one. So in this way, we get this uh, good dispersion in the PVDF. These are the, uh, these are the results in case of uh, filler that we are using here. Uh, uh, these are the XRD and uh, XRD of GO and RGO that we obtain and AFM results that are showing the thickness of the sheet. And here the, is the Raman spectra of both GO and RGO to confirm the synthesis of GO RGO. And these are the results when I, we added these fillers in PVDF like ionic liquid RGO and then both. We can easily see that we are getting beta phase in case of when we are adding uh, filler but alpha phase only alpha phase in case of PVDF. So uh, we uh, characterize our material using the XRD, FTIR and Raman three strategy uh, characterizations and we got uh, we prove the uh, achievement of beta phase in our material. So these two plots are showing basically the uh, effect of concentration and effect of materials. It's variables. Variables ca that can control the phase transition are called order parameters. A strain is also one of the order parameters that control the phase transition of VO2, and various studies have been conducted. 
you can see the study on the strain by dividing by dividing in into in two. One of them is called the internal strain or the interfacial strain. It is easy to think of it as a strain caused by the difference in lattice constant value between the material to be grown and the substrate, substrate in the case of the thin film. Another strain is an external strain. You can literally think of this as a case of straining from the outside. However, due to the fact that most of the substrate are rigid and difficult to bend, many studies on the interfacial strain has, have been conducted in thin films. Through various previous research results based on the strain, we thought that there was insufficient research through the method of applying strain directly from the outside. In particular, in the form of the thin film, we know that it has not been attempted yet. In order to solve the existing problem that rigid substrate cannot be used, a deposition was carried out on various substrates such as flexible glass substrate and soft substrates. Of course, since most of these substrates are output substrate, there is uh, also this advantage that is relatively difficult to grow high quality VO2 thin films. So high quality VO2 thin film synthesis is not achieved. And if high quality VO2 thin film synthesis is not achieved, the experiment was conducted with a plan to grow VO2 thin film with a high quality using buffer layer. Through this picture, I thought of the effect of transforming the VO2 lattice structure by growing a VO2 thin film on flexible, sub flexible substrate and bending it directly outside. The reason is that in case of VO2, the distance and the form angle of vanadium ions change as a phase transition occurs. The core of the phase transition can be thought of as the transformation of vanadium ions grown, on, grown along the C-axis. According to previous reports, applying tensile strain along the C-axis increased the MIT temperature and applying compressive strain along the C-axis decreased the MIT temperature. That is, it can be seen that position of vanadium ions play a very important role in controlling the phase transition phenomena. Actually, I created the MIM structure in two ways. The first method is to deposit with, RF, with the RF sputtering system covering both sides with other substrates such as AO2-3 or SUS. The second method is to deposit VO2 on SUS substrate and then etching with the RI equipment while covering the middle part. The slide show, this slide show how the VO2 thin film was synthesized on flexible glass substrate and how it is subjected to a constant external strain. Figure A is a homemade equipment to apply a certain strain directly from the outside. Through figures B and C, you can see how the sample is loaded into the hour RF sputtering equipment and how the deposition proceeds. Also, through section into D is to go minus one by two. So advantage of this process is high strain, superplastic properties, hypertic strain, and corrosion resistance. These are the advantage of this process. There are two approaches of severe plastic deformation, bottom-up approach and top-down approach. So bottom-up approach is the powder metallurgy alloy deployment, while the top-down approach is severe plastic deformation method like ECAB and ATB. So we are using top-down approach. You can see the different application here, the chamber, you can see uh, the cylinder chamber, piston cylinder chamber, then this nut bolt assemblies and different parts, automotive parts. So these are the application of severe plastic deformation. So before explaining the complete process, uh, I will just explain certain literature review on this area. So these are the these are the scientists so, who worked on this process. So Faraji worked on the material 
z91 and use the process of two channel angular facing okay so he has got some values this is now hardness value okay you will see it strain okay there are deformation values okay then uh sufi worked on magnesium alloy using tcap process and this was the hardness value okay and okay this is the yield strain value 160 nagasekar worked on titanium and faraj worked on brass okay with parallel two channel angular facing so these are some literature reviews so the tool steel okay used for dye now the literature with different material is used but this i am explaining for my process so uh, tube is going to be used for copper and uh, dye dye is will be of s13 to steel is high speed steel so it is generally alloy tool steel carbides and diamonds okay why i am using this tool steel this has the properties of tool steel s13 tool steel is versatile chromium molybdenum hot work steel that is widely used in hot work and cold work tooling applications the hot hardness of s13 resists thermal fatigue cracking which occurs as a result of cyclic heating and cooling cycles in hot work tooling application so these are the uh, some chemical company compositions of s13 steel that is chromium magnesium silicon chromium man, uh, molybdenum vanadium this is not chromium this is carbon okay sorry so 0.4% of carbon 0.40 magnesium silicon chromium okay then then so before going to uh, how i perform the experiment uh, and numerical analysis i will explain what it is go step by step okay so these are the process okay basically this is the model which i made using modeling software that is uh, solid works here you can see this is a tube copper tube and this is a die nuclear die and this is a chamber and this is a mandrel okay so tube is used is of 1 inch now you can see here the tube is passed through this die is passing through a die and when it is passed to and fills improve coating formations and evaluate the performance of the coating form and its resistance mechanism part 2 experimental section as is a schematic of synthesis process of nano hybrid acrylic next model this is formulation of the water bond coating there are the characterization instruments for coating corrosion resistance evaluation and mechanism analysis part 3 results and discussion for the characterization of inorganic nanohydride acrylic resin ir analysis was selected to prove that resin next takes was successfully synthesized Based on the characterization of resin preparation coating and the coating film formation process, it can be seen that the coating has more hydrogen bonds formed by DM and AGH than the resin, and the cross-linking bonds formed by the coating help to increase the cross-linking density of the coating film. The coating has no chemical bonds change, indicating that the coating form is formed by an acrylic self-cross-linking system, and the cross-linking and curing can be completed within 72 hours. Characterization of the resinous particle structure. combined with the monomer and the synthesis mechanism of resin we proposed the module of a single net particle and roughly calculated the percentage of the branch chain free in the aqueous solution to entire single chain 
combined with the differing and entitlement zero of molecular chains in condensed, condensed matter physics, occupied by water volatilization in firm formation, the branch chains diffuse and intent each other under the action of driving force to increase the cross naked density of the coating form. The our entanglement is very difficult, so that a coating form with hyper cross naked density can be formed and maintain relative stable mechanical properties. Based on the synthesis principle, coat formation and the micro characterization of emulsion. We assumed the film formation mechanism of coating when the coating is wedged and spread on substrate. A cylindrical oxygen bond gifted with inorganic nanoparticles formed hydrogen bonds with the mental substrate and produce water. With the one Termination of water, the hydrogen bonds are fairly bonded. The molecular chain in the natural particles diffuse each other's entanglement. The water diffused cross linking network requires a long period of relaxing and rearrangement to form a form with stable mechanical properties. A coating form achieves the best in mechanical properties and maintain a relative stable state. Their crushing resistance and mechanism of the complex fail formed by waterborne coating has been extensively studied, but there is little research about the initial film form mention and accelerate aging the form. We have uh, supplemented this part of research data. Based on the evaluation of the mechanical property during the film form process of the waterborne cortex, we assumed that it takes below 28 days to film. The electron chemical method is used to evaluate the electron chemical crucial resistance of the coating form. We will no longer carry out the specific result analyze process. The results showed that the film curing one day obtained a good crucial resistance. The film curing 15 days shows the best bearing properties. From the coating form with accelerate aging eight months, the film surface has been damaged. As long as the thickness of a coating is too near about in 70 micros, the coating exhibits a good resistance and charge transfer resistance after being merged in 3.5 opacity soldier clear solution for 154 hours and exhibits a strong resistance to electron. And then, after 8 months of accelerated aging, to nuts, the 17 micro thickness of the coating film is further passed in a um, natural salt spray test box for thousand hours. The sample was Corrected by SM and ETS respectively to describe the cross linking morphological and ailment disruption of coating form. The surface of the coating is honeycomb, which has been cured and destroyed by the crucible electron, but the coating near the interface of the subject remains unchanged. The ADS distribution shows that there is no distribution of cream and a small amount of iron in this part, and the coating at the interface is intact. It protects the subject from concluding. It is used for DC magnetron sputtering device. Titanium coating is one way to improve the abrasion res res resistance 
of a material surface undergoing contact motion. Surface coating technology using a titanium thin film with high strength, corrosion resistance, and excellent mechanical properties are widely used to increase abrasion resistance and protect internal materials from external environment. Table one is chemical composition of the aluminum 7075T7351. This was implemented according to the ASTM B209 standard. Next, speaking of figure four, polishing process of aluminum 7075 disc. This specimen is in the experiment was manufactured in a disc shape with a diameter of 32 millimeter and thickness of 10 millimeter. Polishing was performed by checking horizontal rubber through the vertical and horizontal rubber matter. Also polishing was performed using 400 grit paper and aluminum powder. Then each specimen was washed at a room temperature for 10 minutes with an ultrasonic cleaner using ATR core to remove impurities after the polishing operation. The average value of the processed material surface roughness was calculated by measuring surface roughness 10 times with the surface roughness matter. As shown in table one, the average value were 0 0.45 and 0 0.25 respectively. Next, speaking of figure six, schematic of the DC magnet transportering process was shown in figure. At this time, the gas atoms kinetic energy increase and its reactivity and density also increase. Argon ions in the plasma or accelerated towards the cathode via large electronic potential difference, and they collide with the surface of the target. An experiment was first conducted by introducing the electric power intensity of plasma and deposition time as variable to find optimum condition for abrasion resistance of titanium thin film. Table two was during the deposition, working pressure was set to two times 10 to the power of the minus six tor. Pressure gas was argon. DC power was 100 watt and 300 watt and deposition time was 30 minutes and 19 minutes and detailed deposition conditions were shown in table two. Next, table three shows deposition condition according to the working process. The titanium thin film supportory experiment was conducted under two surface roughness condition of polish with 400 grit sandpaper and aluminum powder by setting 100 watt and 300 watt and 30 minutes and 19 minutes for deposition time respectively. Next, figure seven was performed using a PD102 type abrasion tester. Well test condition of Titanium thin film were shown in table four. The materials used in the test was zirconia ball with a diameter 12.7 millimeter and a hardness of 1400 Hb. The experiment was conducted in a boron disc type in which the ball was 
brought into contact with the sample surface to rotate. As shown in table four, the experimental condition were performed by setting a rotation speed at 60 RPM. An experiment time of 30 minutes and particle load of two neuron. Next. Speaking of figure eight, show the aberration tester shape. And the testing device was a PD102 type aberration tester. It is a dry vertical aberration tester that applies pressure from the top while rotating a disc specimen. In road, the monuments and damages the soil of utilities. Not only to the environment, the SO2 gas creates the respiratory problems to the human beings. Upon inhaling for the longer time, SO2 gas can even cause the lung cancer. In the industries, the presence of sulfur in the biofeedstocks severely affect the active of noble active, noble catalyst through the catalyst poisoning. As a result, strict rulers are being continuously implemented on the a permissible sulfur level in the liquid fields across the globe. Thus, the effective desulfurization process is of immediate and higher interest. As shown here, there are five desulfurization methods are commonly known. The first method is a traditional and industrial method namely hydro desulfurization HDS. The main drawback of HDS is its inefficiency towards the removal of TBTS and also have ODS, ADS, EDS, and BDS. But all of the other processes are yet to be industrialized, still early stage more attention is paid on HDS till now. Regarding the design and the preparation of catalyst, first of all, the traditional hydro desulfurization catalyst has the following shortcomings. Also selected uh, sulfidation, more inactive phases, poor dispersion of active phases big slab size and less edge size. So in this study, we have used the SP15 as a spot to influence the structure and the dispersion of active phases via hydrothermal synthesis. The influence of metal uh, precursor on the properties of active phase is also studied. The specific preparation method is shown in the figure below. Let me explain the results and discussion. Initially, the activity of catalyst and the product analysis were carried out. 99% conversation of TBT and noticed after 6 hours under the reaction condition. The temperature is 320 degrees. Uh, the RPM is 600 and the initial hydrogen pressure is 6 ampa. The product of HYD pathway are CHB and BCH. The yields of PP obtained from DDS and the CHP obtained from HYT roots were 60.1% and 13.6% respectively. During HDS, the content of THDBT is initially increased and then decreased, which gradually moved towards the hydrogenation product CHP and BCH, which is the formation of, uh, of negligible isomerization products. DDS roots PP is initial form, which is then converted to BCH.
five different knee and knee blast mode ratios such as 0.1 to 0.5 were used for the preparation of NEMO as catalysts to study the effect of NEMO on the hydrodesulfurization activities. It can be seen that uh, the ratio uh, increased. The reaction activity first raises and then decreases. The active uh, is maximum when the knee and knee blast mole ratio is 0.3, uh, even after the addition of excess as during the preparation. Uh, still, the catalyst with the NEMO ratio uh, 0.3 shows the best active, and uh, therefore uh, is set as the optimal NEMO ratio. With the use of XPS study, uh, the valence state distribution and uh, the substation degree of Mu uh, in the prepared catalyst uh, were studied. Uh, it can be seen that uh, with the change of knee and uh, knee plus Mu ratio, uh, the degree of uh, substation gradually uh, increases, but the reaction active does not follow. With the use of XPS study, uh, the valence state distribution and uh, the substation degree of Mu uh, in the prepared catalyst uh, were studied. Uh, it can be seen that uh, with the change of knee and uh, knee plus Mu ratio, uh, the degree of uh, substation gradually uh, increases, but the reaction active does not follow the regular order. Ultimately, at least supported on alumina in presence of hydrogen uh, under high, uh, high temperature and pressure. You can see this is the chemical uh, reaction involved in the hydro desulfurization. During the reaction, the sulfur from the liquid fuels are, are uh, eliminated uh, from the uh, liquid fuels with the removal of hydrogen sulfide and the corresponding hydrocarbons are formed. And let me... Uh, Explain the problems in HDS. You can know that the hydro is still is the only method operative in the industries, but it has a lot of problems. It needs high temperature and pressure. Among all these listed problems, the very big problem is that it is inefficient to remove the very stable refractive sulfur compounds. And this is the uh, order of uh, hydro desulfurization performance during the removal of different sulfur compounds. And you can see that the refractive sulfur compounds, especially the dipenzothiophene and the substituted, dip substituted dipenzothiophene, they are very stable and they are active. their removal is very difficult by hydro desulfurization. As a result of the uh, difficulties in the removal of refractive sulfur compounds by hydro desulfurization, it is very difficult to imagine the formation of sulfur free fuels with the HDS. So we need to look for the alternative choice other than hydro desulfurization. In the literature, there are, these are the three methods reportedly repeated in the, um, for the uh, desulfurization. And uh, all these methods are very good at removing the refractive sulfur compounds. And these all methods can operate under ambient conditions. But the problem is that if these are all good, then what to choose? And <clears throat> Among these three methods, the oxidative desulfurization looks the best method because uh, the formed oxidase from a, a product shown here can be easily uh, removed by using simply the solvent, which has the more polarity than the fuel. You can see that this is the extraction assisted oxidative desulfurization. Mostly acetonitrile is used in the literature as the extractant to remove the oxidized sulfur compounds from the fuel. And these are some of the merits of ODS. As I already mentioned, uh, the oxidative desulfur uh, oxidative desulfurization can assure the 100 percent removal of uh, refractive sulfur compounds. The formed oxidized compounds can be easily separated by using the extractant. And very advantageously, the oxidative desulfurization process has a wide range of catalysts and oxidants. And polyoxometalase as ODS catalyst. The polyoxometalase are the very good ODS catalysts because they are very att attractive oxidation catalysts due to these following uh, processes. And 
but the problem is that the polyoxymetal layers are generally homogeneous catalysts so it is very difficult to industrialize them so we need to make them heterogeneous to make them industrialized and these are the some of the methods used for heterogenizing the polyoxymetal catalyst among the polyoxymetal family octomolybdate is a very known family uh, because of these eight isomers and importantly the alba and beta isomers can be easily synthesized under aqueous conditions and among alba and beta isomers beta isomer is the best catalyst and it is well known as the already as the oxidation for uh, sulfide compounds you can see the this is the structure of beta isomer and as i already mentioned the polyoxymetalates are generally homogeneous catalyst and in the case of uh, making heterogeneous octomolybdates we need to look for the expensive organic cations otherwise we need to have the solid support where the octomolybdates can be uh, dispersed but the the first method is expensive the second method needs the multiple steps and also it often occurs in poor dispersion so we need to look for the straight forward generation of octomolybdates over the solid supports but this type of uh, process is rare in the literature and if it is possible and that can give the better dispersion of polyoxymetalates and <clears throat> upon looking at the literature the study by novak et al we know that the ammonium heptamolybdate at at 180 degrees celsius can lead to the evolution of octomolybdic molybdates under the uh, at the ph value 3 to 1.5 and after look, and they they have studied this evolution of octomolybdates with the use of raman spectroscopy and <clears throat> by taking uh, and also moreover the tin oxide is a very good uh, material because of its oxygen deficient n type semiconductor properties and moreover this can be a wonderful catalytic support because it also can be a mild oxidation catalyst due to its multiple oxidation states so by uh, taking this tin oxide and by observing the reaction conditions uh, reported by novak et al we combine these two reports and we formed the highly dispersed octomolybdates on the surface of tin oxide by using the hydrothermal this is the hydrothermal synthesis of the highly dispersed octomolybdates on the surface of uh, tin oxide and by using this method we have prepared five different uh, molybdenum oxide catalyst to support around, we, we have prepared five different mox catalyst supported on tin oxide by varying the molybdenum percentage on tin oxide and this percentage are theoretical values and let me discuss about the characterization of uh, the prepared catalyst and the raman spectroscopy is a very important characterization technique to study the uh, characteristics of polyoxometalates and so we used the raman spectroscopy and you can see uh at, 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 you can see this is the peak for two molybdenum catalyst and here the peaks observed at 935 that is correspond to the precursor ammonium heptamolybdate so which means that at lower uh, percentage the, the the ammonium heptamolybdate is there when we increase the uh, molybdenum content the in the at, at five molybdenum loading we get a very minor peak at 969 whereas that minor peaks become highly intense and that is at 969 and this peak corresponds to the the pto if you use the following device the material is photocatalytic when the ink change the color from blue to pink and this is the numerical result that can you obtain with the device you can different numerical parameter that uh, allow compare different photocatalytic efficiency materials the comparison of fullerene device and conventional technique fullerene device is a portable equipment you can measure in situ condition is non destructive measurement is fast cheap
an easy measurement and results interpretation. This is some of preliminary tests. We analyze different material, different building material that include commercial and lab prepared materials, paint, mentitious material with different photocatalyst configuration. First, we analyze this material with nitrogen oxide air purification test based on the ISO standard 22197. This is the comparison between nitrogen oxide degradation tests and following numerical data. You can observe a good correlation with some deviation. The deviation is related with the high porous material condition. Therefore, now work about the improve of the incomplication on rawness samples, the increment of the number of tested materials, and finally, they compare with other standardized tests.